So I thought it would be good to take a real deep dive into diabetes. We're nurses, right? So we understand diabetes, but I want you to understand it at a much deeper level because there are a lot of developments that have been happening over the past 10 years or so um, that have really added complexity to the management of diabetes. So I thought we should look into some things like DPP-4 and SGLT-2 and some of those things that you hear mentioned, uh, but maybe you never really understood them. Well, hopefully that changes. So that's our old friend, the pancreas, right? And remember that the in the pancreas lie the islets of Langerhans and the beta cells specifically are the ones that we're interested in because they produce insulin. Now, why is insulin important? Well, we all know that insulin and diabetes are related, right? Lack of insulin uh, is the hallmark of diabetes. But did you, did you really understand that insulin is 100% required to get blood sugar into the cells? There is no other way that sugar can get into the cells except if there's insulin. Here's a, uh, an experiment that was done with an animal model that was um, that had its pancreas removed. And you can see that the intracellular glucose never changes appreciably, although the extracellular glucose continues to rise. Well, look what happens when you introduce insulin. Now, as the intracellular glucose, I'm sorry, as the extracellular glucose goes up, so does the intracellular glucose because it's insulin that delivers that sugar across the membrane. What is it that happens? Well, I'm glad you asked. The insulin molecule hits the insulin receptor on the cells and that does several things. One thing that it does, of course, is allow glucose in. And when glucose goes in, it goes in through this GLUT4 protein. That is a, a glucose transport, that's GLUT, glucose transport for protein that allows the um, glucose to go from the uh, extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid through this membrane. It gets put into a GLUT4 vesicle and then insulin um, substrate, uh, receptor substrates can take their effect on them and produce things like fatty acid synthesis, protein synthesis, glycogen synthesis, uh, cell wall, not cell wall, but cell membrane growth and survival, um, and then also cellular differentiation and growth and gene expression. All those things happen as a result of this um, uh, glucose coming into the cell. Now, the other thing that happens that I sort of glossed over is that amino acids and electrolytes get transported into the cell. And that's what happens through these other channels. So amino acids that are required for protein synthesis come in through the um, cell membrane when the insulin receptor is activated. And look what else happens. You know that when somebody's in the hospital and they become hyperkalemic, in an emergency, we can give insulin to... Um, transport potassium intracellularly. Well, the way that happens is through this mechanism. Glucose comes in through this GLUT4 receptor that also activates the potassium uh, transport mechanism that brings potassium intracellularly. So those are the things that happens when, uh, th those are the things that happen when insulin um, acts on the cell membrane now, there are some other th physiologic mechanisms that you need to understand, too. So this is where all those funny initials come in. We talked about one of the GLUT uh, receptors. There are also GLUT2 receptors. In fact, there's like 15 of these things, um, not all of which do we talk about clinically. Um, but the ones that we do care about clinically are the GLUT2 cells. Those are present in uh, nephrons. The GLUT3 um protein is important because that's what facilitates transport of glucose in neurons and in the placenta. I don't know if you know this, but um, I just finished telling you that insulin is required to get glucose into cells, but not all cells. There are um, specialized neurons in the brain that um, do not require insulin. 
Why not? Well, because they have evolved to be able to suck up all the glucose that they need, right? They don't need an intermediary because it would be uh, deleterious for the brain to have to get a partner to be involved in getting glucose into the cells because the brain needs that glucose um, readily. So there are certain neurons that can pull glucose in directly, and that's through, uh, in part, the GLUT3 receptor. Then there's GLUT4, which is most of what we talk about um, in human physiology because that's uh, the uh, receptor in or the protein, the transport protein in adipose tissue and muscle cells. And we all know that glucose loves those things. Well, the reason that it loves those things is because of those, um, uh, because of that GLUT4 protein. Sodium glucose transport 2 receptors are uh, proteins that are mostly located in the proximal tubule and when they get activated they facilitate the reabsorption of sodium and glucose so think about how awesome it would be to have a drug that could inhibit those receptors in the kidney and allow the sodium and the glucose that got trapped in the um, uh, in the bloodstream to just disappear in the urine and never be seen again. Well, that's exactly what SGLT2 inhibitors are. And they are sort of the new magic drugs that have uh, come about in the past couple of years. Not only for diabetes, but also for heart failure, for hypertension, for prevention of sudden cardiac death, for uh, prevention of atrial fib and other atrial arrhythmias. I mean, um, they are just coming about in a big way. It's very exciting, although very expensive. So we might not be seeing them used clinically while they cost $700 a month. It's ridiculous. All right, moving on, DPP-4 uh, proteins are ones that inactivate GLP-1, GLP-1 being glucagon-like peptide-1, uh, or the incretins. Now, DPP-4 also has a role in some neoplasms, and we learned in a recent New England Journal of Medicine article that you can click on here to see, by the way, um, it also has a role in lessening the chance of uh, graft-versus-host disease in um, stem cell transplants. So kind of exciting. It's a, um, a relatively new, um, I don't even think it's indicated yet. I don't think it's been studied enough, but, but it's been described. So I assume that they will be doing those studies to get the FDA indication for that. Finally then, uh, GLP-1 or in Cretin um, is a, protein that enhances the release of insulin, and this is the important part, in the postprandial state. So you know we have drugs that are secretagogues, right? They squeeze the pancreas, uh, and those are the sulfonylureas. Well, we stopped using them because they, you know, they just inadvertently, uh, without thinking about it, they just squeeze the pancreas and make more insulin available. Well, that's not a good thing for uh for the uh, side effects that we get from, or, or the complications that we get from diabetes. So if we could have a way of uh, squeezing the pancreas only when there's food that needs to be, uh, got, or the, when there's glucose that needs to be put into cells, that is in the postprandial state, that would be ideal, right? Because that's exact, that's a physiologic, um, mechanism. That's the way the body works. And that's what GLP-1 uh, drugs do. They enhance the release of insulin in the postprandial state. So they're big up-and-comers as well. Uh, and they have some cardiovascular outcomes um, to speak of. All right, so more details about the GLUT proteins. Uh, GLUT2, again, um, sends glucose, galactose, and fructose from the brush border cells in the gut uh, into the paracellular space. So it gets rid of them, but doesn't put them necessarily into the uh, 
uh, bloodstream directly. And then the GLOT5 receptor, not that we talked about it, not that we care about it, but it's responsible for pulling in fructose uh, from the intestinal lumen. Glucose transports the SGLT2 uh, receptor in the nephron. Again, it pulls in both sodium and glucose into the um, cells in the proximal tubule so that they can be moved into the bloodstream. Now that requires energy, of course. It requires ATP to run this sodium potassium pump, um, but that moves the sodium into the capillary and uh, along with it goes glucose via the GLUT2 uh, transport. Very, very big thing that's happening in uh, diabetes management today. So the other thing that we need to talk about is this. Um, so I'm going to give you this little scenario. A 65-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes goes to bed with a fasting glucose of 110. She has nothing to eat after um, she goes to bed. And when she wakes up in the morning, her glucose is 200. How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, you know that Dietary carbohydrates are the source of blood sugar, right? Well, they're only one source of blood sugar. So when we eat carbohydrates, the body converts them uh, into sugar, and then that excess sugar gets converted to glycogen, right? If, it, if the cells of the body don't need it, we have a storage form, which is glycogen. And that glycogen then can be stored in muscle and liver, predominantly. Those are the those are the big two places that it gets stored. Okay? But there's more to it than that. So um, how is it that the body uh, ends up with a blood sugar of 200 in the morning after not eating all night? Well, one of the ways is that the body breaks down glycogen. So glycogenolysis or breakdown of glycogen, and glycogen, by the way, is just a big ball of glucose. So it breaks down that glucose or that glycogen uh, and makes a usable form of glucose, and that gets um, sugar into the cells. What's the other way? So you can imagine starvation, right? In starvation, at the beginning, you uh, use whatever's available in the food. Well, there's not many calories when you're not eating. So then you use your glycogen stores. But, you know, any heavy physical exertion uh, is going to deplete your glycogen stores. So how do you get glucose then? If you're not eating and you're not breaking down glycogen, gluconeogenesis, right? This is the breakdown of um, fat or protein into sugar. And remember this whole Krebs cycle and all that jazz? Don't memorize this. It's ridiculous. You don't need to know all that stuff. You just need to know that we get a whole lot of uh, energy out of uh, using this glucose in the cell. And that uh, energy then allows us to do things, right? It allows muscles to contract. It allows, um, well, it allows all the physiologic processes. Um, but when there is no sugar available, the body can break down proteins and fats to make sugar. And that's what happens. So what are the diseases that we talk about with respect to insulin? Well, we talk about diabetes mellitus, right? Not diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is... Um, a brain thing or a pituitary thing, I should more specifically. Diabetes mellitus is um, excessive urination uh, that is caused by elevated um, blood sugar. So diabetes type 1, what we used to call juvenile onset uh, and also used to call insulin dependent, um, is one type of diabetes, and then type 2 diabetes is adult onset or non-insulin dependent. We don't refer to them that way anymore. Um, frequently, we have patients who are type 2 diabetics who have what we call insulin resistance, right? And that insulin resistance is such that we just can't manage it without giving them some insulin. They need more insulin uh, than what is available in their body for whatever reason. 
And so in that case, we call those patients insulin requiring non-insulin dependent diabetics. It gets really messy though with all that terminology. So we really just like type one and type two. All right, and know that you can have type two diabetics who are taking insulin. Signs and symptoms of, diary, uh, of diabetes, remember the three Ps, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. Polyuria is frequent urination. Polydipsia is being um, uh, thirsty all the time. And polyphagia is being hungry all the time. And uh, those things are the hallmarks of uh, type 2 diabetes. Glycosuria, glucose in the urine. Now this is interesting when we start talking about this new class of drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, because for years and years and years, people believe this slide, that it's always bad to have glucose in the urine. Wait, now we have this new drug that costs $700 a month and, uh, and it makes you have sugar in the urine? How can that be? Well, Gluco uh, glycosuria is a result of uncontrolled diabetes. And it just so happens that it's a convenient target for us to use um, to get rid of blood sugar, right? And that's what the SGLT2 inhibitors do. Um, and we just have to ignore the part that we learned about glycosuria always being bad. Well, we can't ignore it entirely because having glucose in the urine puts you at higher risk for urinary tract infections, which can be a problem with that drug. But, um, but remember, glycosuria from untreated diabetes is bad. Glycosuria from the drugs that we use can be bad in certain circumstances, but usually we like it. All right. Um, unexplained weight loss, fatigue, blurred vision, those are all things that go along with diabetes. But remember the first thing, people are asymptomatic or don't recognize the symptoms for a long time. And their first presenting symptom may be what? DKA. All right, so how do we make the diagnosis of diabetes? Well, these change periodically, but last time I looked, they were a non-fasting glucose of 200 or higher, a fasting blood sugar of 126 or higher with a second repeat level drawn that's also 126 or more. You can also have the diagnosis from an oral glucose tolerance test with uh, a result of 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher after drinking um, the glucose preparation and waiting two hours. But Sometimes we just like lab tests, right? And that seems like a lot of work to do all that stuff. So a hemoglobin A1C is convenient. We didn't used to use this for a diagnosis. We used to just use it for management. But now we have um, established parameters that we can make the diagnosis of diabetes with it. Okay. So let's talk about hemoglobin A1C very briefly. You already know all this stuff. So you know that it's the gold standard for regulating diabetes. Um, the blood sugar that attaches to the hemoglobin molecule is what's being measured. So that has some important uh, implications, right? This is not a very good test to use in people who are anemic, for instance, because when you're anemic, you're turning over blood cells more quickly and um, you don't have um, uh, red blood cells hanging around for the full three months uh, to soak up all of that hemoglobin, uh, all of that glucose. So, you know, there are some caveats to using this test that, um, and that's just one of them. Um, again, it indicates the blood sugar control over the past three months. If you want, by the way, this is just extra credit. If you want to know the blood sugar, uh, the average blood sugar over the past three weeks, we can measure fructosamine levels. And that tells us what the blood sugar control has been like over the past three weeks. All right. Um, no more. I'm not going to discuss that anymore. It's just one of those little freebies that I'm giving you. So what does it mean when you have a hemoglobin A1C measurement? Well, we know that a 1% change in hemoglobin A1C uh, reflects a change of about 30 milligrams per deciliter in average blood glucose. So for every 1% increase, your um, average blood sugar is 30 milligrams per deciliter higher, okay? For instance, you can read that. Um, as the hemoglobin A1C increases, uh, 
we know that the risk of complications of diabetes increases also. And that's why we monitor this um, carefully. So let's talk about type 1 diabetes. When you think about type 1 diabetes, I want you to think autoimmune cause, right? The body is destroying the um, beta cells. That's exactly what's happening. And this is the process that happens. So first of all, you have to have some sort of um, predisposition and uh, an environmental um, component. So this is not one of those inherited genetic diseases, but rather uh, sort of a situational uh, disease that occurs in the right milieu. So the um, autoantigens form um, on insulin producing beta cells and then they circulate and then they process those antigens on the antigen presenting cells which activates the, um, the T cells and the T cells then produce interferon, gamma, interleukin-2, interleukin-4, and that fires up the rest of the immune response that eventually results in destruction of beta cells. Now, one other thing that I think is important for you to know about, um, just so that you get a handle on this, and I probably should have had this slide earlier when we were talking about insulin, sorry, but um, when I was in college, um, my... Uh, organic chemistry professor, Dr. Frazier, had a son who uh, had type 1 diabetes. And back before the internet was a, was a, a thing, um, that's how old I am, pretty old, right? So back before the internet was a thing, you actually had to like go to the library and look stuff up. And at our school, we didn't have a ton of medical references. And I could never understand the answer to this um, problem. His question was, what is C-peptide? What, what does it do? What, what's the use of, in measuring C-peptide levels uh, in somebody with diabetes? Well, here's the answer. The pancreas produces these um, uh, insulin components as part of this long, uh, long chain called pro-insulin. Pro-insulin has two ends to it that are insulin. So the A chain gets cleaved off, that's an insulin molecule. The B chain gets um, uh, cleaved off, that's an insulin molecule. And then what's left that gets secreted out into the bloodstream is this thing called C-peptide, right? So there's the A string, there's the B string, and the C string or C-peptide is what's left. Can you think now why it might be useful to measure C-peptide? Early in the course of the disease, as the uh, beta cells are meeting their demise, they're still producing some insulin, right? Well, the amount of insulin that they're producing can be measured with C-peptide. So we can measure the C-peptide level, and that lets us understand um, whether the insulin that is circulating in that patient's bloodstream is coming from us giving them uh, recombinant insulin that's made in the lab, which doesn't have C-peptide, or whether the insulin that we're giving, uh, that, that they have circulating is actually their own insulin. And it's their own insulin if there's C-peptide circulating. So we can sort of measure the C-peptide levels and we can see over time at where the, um, where the disease is in terms of destroying all the beta cells. All right, so more about type 1 diabetes. You have this pancreatic atrophy. You have autoimmune disease most of the time that, um, that results in the type 1 diabetes. There are non-immune causes uh, like pancreatitis um, or this type 1B uh, diabetes that um, has also been described. But by and large, it's autoimmune uh, and, and that's what we're going to focus on. The genetic susceptibility has to do with a first degree relative uh, and a strong association with the MHC, right? The major histocompatibility complex. Then the environmental factors are some viral infection, H. pylori infection, exposure to different proteins in cow's milk, some sort of um, impetus 
for this um, destruction of the beta cells to happen in the presence of the genetic susceptibility. Then um, the immunologically mediated destruction of the beta cells happens from the lymphocyte and macrophage infiltration, and we talked about that sort of briefly. Um, and then there's also um, hyperglycemia, glucagon, and hyperketonemia that, uh, that occur. And that happens as a result of breakdown, again, of the islet cells, but not only the beta cells, but also the alpha cells as well. So clinical manifestations, you know, there's a long preclinical period as the um, pancreas is losing beta cells. Um, patients can maintain a, uh, you know, an asymptomatic course for a prolonged period of time. Um, at the point that they get 80 to 90 percent loss of uh, function of those beta cells, that's where the hyperglycemia develops, okay? And the, the resultant polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia, weight loss, and fatigue all happen. So when you think about type 2 diabetes, think about insulin resistance. That's 99% of what this disease is about. So it also starts with a genetic predisposition, and obesity plays a role as well in most cases, not all cases, but most cases. And that, of course, is um, uh, produced by and certainly worsened by um, diet that's high in carbohydrates and, uh, in particular, simple carbohydrates like sugar and also inactivity. Now, you know, um, rarely, if ever, has a study been done that shows um, exercise helps people lose weight. In fact, most studies have shown that exercise leads to weight gain because it stimulates appetite. Um, and with more activity, you get more muscle mass, you know, that whole thing. Um, that being said, nothing is more important than getting up and moving, right? The very best thing you can do for your heart and for your health overall is to get up and move and be physically active. Um, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a lie that we're selling to patients, telling them it's going to help them lose weight. Um, that being said, the rest of the insulin resistance uh, and type 2 diabetes story looks like this. So with obesity and the genetic predisposition comes uh, a decrease in relative mass of the beta cells and therefore a decrease in the function of those beta cells. Incretin um, activity decreases, that is the uh, substances GLP and GIP, uh, I'm sorry, GLP-1 and GIP that stimulate um, release of insulin in the postprandial state. That's what incretins do. And so there's decreased activity of, of them. There's hypoinsulinemia as a result. And then glucagon has a role. And glucagon is the exact opposite of insulin, and that leads to tissue effects and hyperglycemia, and that is type 2 diabetes. Now, there's also on the insulin resistance side, there's more demand for insulin synthesis. So the body wants to make more, and that um, leads to hyperinsulinemia. So with the um, higher levels of circulating insulin goes some of the macrovascular complications that we see. The atherosclerotic disease tends to be as a result of the um, hyperinsulinemia, while the microvascular changes that we see tend to be from, uh, from the... Um, high blood sugars. So remember that diabetes type 2 is far more common, far more common than type 1. All right. Um, there's a misprint on this slide. It's about 90% of diabetes in the U.S. Type 1 diabetes is about 10%. Uh, 
but type 2 diabetes is far more common and is about 90% of all the diabetes in this country. It's associated with this metabolic syndrome, right, which is central obesity, dyslipidemia, um, early hypertension, maybe because of uh, excess um, fluid on board, elevated fasting blood glucose levels and all that stuff. Now, we used to say this was adult onset, but now we have kids, kids, two-year-olds who have type 2 diabetes because of their um, uh, habits, all right? Um, mechanisms we talked about, um, but remember that, uh, that it's much more complex than just um, uh, obesity causing insulin resistance. It's a much, much more complex thing. Uh, and there's a lot of actors at play, um, but we know that uh, regular exercise and the right medicines um, and diet in particular uh, are the keys. Once you start insulin, though, that's a really hard time to lose weight, right? Because insulin's job is to put on weight. It's to get sugar into the cells. Adipose tissue has all those GLUT4 receptors. It sucks up glucose. Um, and, uh, it, and it's just a really, really hard thing to, uh, achieve weight loss when you're on insulin. All right. So, um, insulin resistance, we talked about beta cell dysfunction. There is some beta cell dysfunction. They, they work, but the beta cell mass is decreased, right? So there are less beta cells. Uh, and then there's some inflammation that happens as well. Our old, old friend inflammation. Um, glucagon, which is the opposite of insulin, all right? Remember that glucagon is the opposite of insulin. All the things that insulin does, 100% um, opposite with glucagon. So the pancreatic alpha cells are the ones that um, generate glucagon, and, uh, and they're stimulated in type 2 diabetes, um, more information about amylin and ghrelin and all that, and we're not going to bother talking about um, treatment. Uh, except I want you to see where some of these drugs are coming into play now. So uh, metformin, they refer to as a biguanide. I don't know why. It's the only one, right? Uh, but metformin, incidentally, does not, does not cause hypoglycemia ever. Well, I shouldn't say never, um, but it by itself does not cause hypoglycemia because it has three effects. It decreases glucose absorption from the gut. It improves insulin resistance. And the third thing that it does is it decreases hepatic production of glucose. Do any of those things sound like they can make your blood sugar plummet? No, they don't. You cannot become hypoglycemic. You cannot have a hypoglycemic event when you're just on metformin, okay? Now, you can be on metformin and insulin and have a hypoglycemic event, for sure, right? That is for sure. Uh, or some of these other medicines. Similarly, um, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors are not associated with hypoglycemia because all they're doing is getting rid of sodium and glucose in the urine, right? They're not producing more insulin production. What does produce more insulin production? Sulfonylureas, right? The secretagogues. Those are the ones that are pushing out uh, all of the insulin from the pancreas. Um, Actose is the only TZD that's left. We had our fun with the TZDs back in the 90s. And um, oh, by the way, they killed some people, so we don't like them too much. Actose is the only one left on the market, and we rarely see that being used. Precos is another one that we hardly see used, uh, mostly because of the GI side effects. It um, makes people gassy, and they don't like that. Um, but the GLP-1 agonists, uh, like Victosa, very good because they stimulate insulin production in the postprandial state. That's the time you want it, right? You want it in the postprandial state. For that reason, and several other reasons, um, uh, Victoza is associated with um, improved cardiac 
effects. This slide gives you a little more understanding, a visual representation of the sites of action uh, of these uh, diabetes drugs that we're using these days. I just thought this would be helpful to sort of solidify those things in your head. There are some other types of diabetes. Um, they can be, uh, diabetes can be caused from genetic diseases. Uh, it can also be caused by diseases of the pancreas, pancreatitis and other uh, diseases. Um, there can be drug or chemical induced beta cell dysfunction. And then there's this thing called maturity onset diabetes of youth, which is uh, an autosomal dominant uh, mutation that produces diabetes um, uh, before the age of 25. Pretty rare. We don't see that much. Gestational diabetes. You know that gestational diabetes um, puts patients at risk for type 2 diabetes um, within a very short period of time, like just a couple of years, I think. I don't remember the official numbers, but um, women who have gestational diabetes are likely to develop type 2 diabetes uh, within just a couple of years after um, having that diagnosis. Not all, but higher incidence. So let's talk about the complications of diabetes. Well, there's acute complications like hypoglycemia, right? That's a... Um, that's a complication, not of diabetes, but of the treatment of diabetes. And then there's DKA and HHS and these other uh, issues as well. We're going to talk about hypoglycemia because it is a major, major problem. Um, we really don't like hyperglycemia, right? We don't want your blood sugar to be elevated because... It increases your chance of coronary disease and kidney disease and eye problems, and it'll kill you over a period of years. But we really hate hypoglycemia because it kills you instantly, right? It kills you dead. This is what type 1 diabetics who are on insulin pumps fear the most. They fear having a low blood sugar overnight while they're sleeping that they never sense and they don't wake up. And that's a huge concern. Um, you know, so we, we have to manage this uh, aggressively. Um, it happens in um, uh, adults who have uh, over, who have been over medicated, uh, again, with insulin, typically. Um, the manifestations are tachycardia, palpitations, diaphoresis, tremors, pallor, anxiety. Uh, and by the way, a lot of those things are tempered by beta blockers, right? So we love beta blockers because they're wonderful medicines, but they can mask hypoglycemia. You probably remember that from studying for NCLEX. So there are um, patients, <clears throat> excuse me, patients who develop DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and there are patients who develop HHS or hyperosmolar non-ketotic, uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, or we used to call it HHNK. There's a million different names for it. But you probably remember that patients with type 1 diabetes are more prone to DKA and patients with type 2 diabetes are more prone to HHS. So in DKA, you get blood sugars that are, you know, 300, 400, 500, somewhere like that. With HHS, you can get blood sugars that are ridiculous, like, you know, 900, 1,000, I mean, super high. What is it that makes people at risk for one versus the other? And why do you develop one versus the other? To figure that out, you got to follow this. And let's start with DKA. When you have this um, insulin insufficiency, the blood sugar goes up, right? When it's mild to moderate, you get hyperglycemia, and then you get a little bit extra diuresis at the kidney because the blood sugar is high. And that leads to polyuria. But when you have profound insulin insufficiency, then you have lipolysis, and that forms um, 
uh, ketone bodies, essentially, that show up in the urine. And those ketone bodies then, along with the profound hypoglycemia, um, cause di diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, why do they develop that at a lower level than what type 2 diabetics develop HHS at? Well, it has to do with this hyperglycemia, right? Remember that in type 2 diabetes, there's still insulin that's floating around. You still have insulin floating around that's able to get some sugar into the cells. So what happens is you get this mild to moderate um, increase in the blood sugar, that causes some increased diuresis, and then you have dehydration that results. And then you have more of this cycle. You have more hyperglycemia because you're getting rid of um, fluid in the urine, and then you have more dehydration. And then you have more hyperglycemia and more. And this cycle continues to the point where you become hyperosmolar. Your blood is hyperosmolar. And when that happens, you put out even more urine. And that leads to central nervous system depression and just an ongoing problem. So it's cyclical in the sense that, the, that you lose more fluid in the urine. That increases your blood sugar which causes more urine to be lost, which increases your blood, your blood sugar relatively, which causes more diuresis, which causes more relative hyperglycemia. And that cycle just continues on until you um, become um, uh, hyperosmolar and uh, you develop the um, coma without having uh, ketoacidosis. Okay. So, looking more carefully at them or more closely. Um, there's this absolute or relative deficiency of insulin and an increase in the counter-regulatory hormones in, D in DKA, okay? The counter-regulatory hormones being things like what? Glucagon. Um, this is most common in type 1 diabetes, but it can be seen in type 2 diabetes. And we tend to see it when we have a well-controlled diabetic who has some sort of insult to the system. They get an infection, they have surgery, they're in major trauma, they have an MI. Some sort of thing pushes their close balance over the edge and they um, become uh, ketotic and uh, have DKA. The clinical manifestations are typically a glucose level that's over 250. And again, it doesn't get super high before they develop um, a ketotic uh, coma and, and all of the metabolic disarray that goes along with it. They get, um, an, uh, uh, they get acidotic, um, they get uh, hypokalemic, uh, it's quite a mess. HHS, or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome, um, is also a life-threatening emergency, typically associated with type 2 diabetes. There is some insulin floating around, and so that allows them to maintain enough um, uh, cellular function that their blood sugars can get super high as they get more and more dehydrated. Okay. Again, clinical manifestations, um, often uh, blood sugars are higher than 600 and there's uh, absent or no, uh, I'm sorry, absent or low urine ketones. So those are the short-term consequences of diabetes. The long-term consequences uh, are uh, shown here. So up here are the causes of hyperglycemia and we know the pancreas is involved, right? And the beta cell and the insulin production, yada, yada, yada. We know that the, in, the adipose tissue is involved because of the lipolysis. And we know that the um, uh, inflammatory state um, causes accumulation of macrophages and such. And we know that, um, that there's uh, uh, the GLUT4 receptors in the adipose tissue. 
Uh, all of those things are contributing to this uh, hyperglycemia. The liver has a role as well with gluconeogenesis. The digestive system, GLP-1 and GIP, those incretins um, uh, are involved. The decreased stomach secretion of ghrelin makes people hungry and they, uh, uh, and they I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. There's decreased um, ghrelin secretion that doesn't make you hungry. Um, but that has the effect of slowing down transition through the gut. Um, and that's why our patients often um, need some help with that in the form of Reglan or, or something of that nature. The kidneys involved, we talked about the kidneys, we talked about the muscle, and of course the brain is involved uh, as well. What are the consequences? Well, you know that neuropathy, I'm sorry, retinopathy um, uh, has... Uh, is one of the potential um, consequences. You know that neuropathy is hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, stroke, coronary artery disease, uh, steatohepatitis, um, uh, or uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, gastroparesis. Again, we talked about that with um, the uh, decreased ghrelin secretion. Uh, nephropathy, glomerular nephritis, uh, I'm sorry, glomerular sclerosis, uh, and the development of CKD. And then there's the oxidative stress that produces an immune response too and puts people at higher risk of infection, cancer. And I don't know if you know, but diabetes is actually a hypercoagulable state as well. Um, it puts people in a, uh, at a higher risk of blood clot formation, uh, both in terms of uh, DVT, though just a little, and also um, in terms of heart attack and stroke. So we characterize most of those things uh, as either microvascular or macrovascular disease. Microvascular disease is, the, is essentially the effects of hyperglycemia, um, over time and mostly in the capillaries. And that causes a thickening in the capillary basement membrane. The endothelial cells become hyperplastic. Um, there's thrombosis that happens, again, that hypercoagulable state. Uh, and then um, uh, hyperglycemia and hypoxia and ischemia are other contributors to that microvascular disease. Diabetic retinopathy is a um, uh, is the eye um, manifestation, and it can take the form of several different things. It can be maculopathy, where the macular uh, the macula is involved directly, and that can cause vessel occlusion and ischemia in the eye, which um, further worsens visual um, deficits. There can be macular edema as well, that fluid accumulation uh, behind or in the macula. And um, off to the right here is the, um, uh, the pathophysiology uh, explained. Diabetic nephropathy is um, another th component that we take very seriously. Any diabetic is at risk for nephropathy, and we want to protect the kidneys as much as possible to avoid them having to sit in a dialysis chair for 12 hours a week, right? Three days a week for four hours at a time. What a horrible thing to have to endure. And it doesn't even make you feel perfect. It makes you feel, eh, okay, right? Keeps you alive. Um, so the... So diabetes, remember, I think it's like 80%. Is it 80%? No, 60% um, of the uh, chairs in dialysis units are filled by diabetics, 60%. Um, hypertension accounts for another 20%. So together, 80% of all um, uh, renal failure is associated with uh, diabetes or hypertension. So we can target this. We can look for glomerular damage. And how do we see that? Well, we see protein in the urine. So when we see microalbumin in the urine, 
And that's the test we do, not albumin, but microalbumin in the urine. Uh, when we see that, uh, and really in any diabetic, we start drugs that will decrease that. So some of those drugs are um, uh, anti-aldosterone medicines, uh, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers. Those are all renal protective drugs. Uh, neuropathies, of course, are another thing that uh, happen, and this has to do with axonal and Schwann cell degeneration, and uh, that results in uh, pain and loss of sensation. Uh, can also cause uh, loss of proprioception, which is um, knowing the position of your body or body parts in space. Macrovascular complications are typically large vessel um, and uh, include things like um, uh, ischemic areas in the uh, periphery, um, can also include higher risk for MIs and strokes, uh, and those things are detailed here. Specifically, atherosclerosis uh, is a uh, has as a major contributor diabetes and uh, that all really revolves around this endothelial dysfunction and so here again ACE inhibitors are useful in minimizing or uh, or treating I should say not minimizing because it's it's an overwhelming process but we can affect that process by using ACE inhibitors um, because they maintain nitric, ox nitric oxide production. Um, and that prevents the platelets from getting so sticky and, um, and getting activated and, and forming uh, white clot, which leads to uh, vessel occlusion, etc. And so this whole thing is really regulated. This whole atherosclerotic process is really regulated by endothelial dysfunction. Uh, that's a result of all of these components. The last thing I want to mention, just a little joke. I hear so many of um, uh, my students and um, so many um, friends and uh, nurses and everybody I know talks about um, getting hypoglycemic. Well, I just want to show you um, the list of the known causes of hypoglycemia. So obviously... Um, uh, diabetics who are on insulin or secretagogues uh, can become hypoglycemic. And we talked about that. It's devastating. It's uh, a, a thing that we need to fix and prevent uh, at all stops. We can also see hypoglycemia in critical illness, right? Uh, whether it's kidney or um, heart or liver failure, sepsis, any of those things can um, can cause hypoglycemia as well. Hormone deficiencies like uh, epinephrine, glucagon, cortisol, all of those uh, can be associated with hypoglycemia. Non-islet cell tumors and insulinomas, a rare neuroendocrine tumor of the beta cells of the pancreas, um, usually benign, but it requires a Whipple procedure, and it's a huge thing, and it's a major involvement. All of this to say that what you feel when you say you're hypoglycemic, and not you specifically, but what people mean when they say they're hypoglycemic is that they're hungry. That's the feeling that you get, right? Yeah, your blood sugar goes down, but it doesn't go down to 40, right? You don't pass out and become... Uh, you, you, you don't have that kind of problem. So I certainly hope that patients, uh, who, you know, and friends who I'm talking to are not hypoglycemic because if they have one of these things, uh, that's a bad, that's a bad thing. When you feel those feelings, you're hungry, not hypo, hypoglycemic. All right. That's all I got for you. Um, that's it.